Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, UCL in Peter Kovnik's lab, and I've been working on generating accurate graphene oxide structures for uh, atomic simulations using machine learning for mechanical and biological applications. Um, so this talk's uh, split into three. I'm going to talk about how we generate uh, accurate graphene oxide structures and why that's really important and the effect on percolation and why that's uh, a useful uh, concept in graphene oxide chemistry. And then I'll talk about the applications that we've used these structures in. And finally, I wanna talk about the VECMA toolkit. So VECMA is a European project, uh, which stands for Verified Exascale um, for multi uh, computing for multiscale applications. And uh, there's a few tools in there that have been really useful in our projects that help with um, ensemble generation and handling validation, verification, and certain qualification. And I think that'll be very useful to a lot of people in this consortium. Um, so first, graphene oxide. Um, hopefully we all know what graphene is and why it's so uh, got so much attention lately. Uh, graphene oxide is its derivative. Um, it tends to be a lot easier to synthesize and a lot easier to handle. So you take graphite or graphene and put it in a highly oxidative environment and you end up with a bunch of oxygen containing functional groups. Uh, so this structure that's shown on this slide was proposed in like the 90s by Lerf and Klinowski. So they correctly identified all the functional groups or most of them, but uh, this sort of nanoscale structure was less clear. So when people simulated uh, graphene oxide, which is important for a lot of, well, obviously people want to do that, um, they would tend to throw these functional groups randomly across the surface. And I think that's, well, we think that's an unnecessarily poor assumption. and It fails to capture a lot of the important things that graphene oxide uh, has. So um, if we look at some more up-to-date experimental data, we can see that there's, uh, and this has kind of become clear in the past 10 years, that we have two phases in graphene oxide. We have uh, graphitic domains where there is no oxidation and uh, oxidized domains. Uh, this is sort of chemically intuitive as well because we know that once you've oxidized uh, a carbon structure, uh, like an aromatic carbon structure in one site, it's more likely to be oxidized nearby. Um, so the question is really like, how, how do we generate these structures actually accurately, like how? Yeah. Um, so these, these properties will be interesting for many of its applications. So we're interested primarily in its material applications. Um, so when you have uh, a polymer matrix, you want to disperse a, a particle within it. So this is a general slide saying how 2D particles, uh, if they're fully exfoliated and expose themselves to the polymer matrix, they can make the full matrix a lot uh, stronger and you know, improve its properties. Graphene oxide tends to be a lot better than graphene in this case because um, the polymer graphene oxide interaction is stronger and it uh, is more likely to exfoliate. So this is one of the reasons why graphene oxide is perhaps becoming more popular in this space than graphene. Um, it's also important for biological applications. So um, if you, well, the structure of graphene oxide will really depend on how soluble it is. So if it has graphitic domains, that means it will have hydrophobic regions and hydrophilic regions. And this can be really important for things like uh, uh, protein binding and drug targeting, the things that people want to use it for. So this is kind of a summary of the work that uh, I've been involved with. Um, we, um, we did some parameterization of graphene for molecular dynamic simulations. Um, uh, that was not using machine learning, but having seen some of the talks here at this consortium, maybe that would have uh, helped our endeavors. Um, we just fit some, uh, an angular potential to some uh, experimental data. Uh, then I generated you know, this 
uh, graphene oxygen structure, which I'm going to tell you about next. And that has informed simulation, coarse grain simulations of graphene oxide dispersions. And it's also um, uh, gone into simulating nanocomposites with uh, a multi scale simulation where we couple molecular dynamics to finer element. Um, and that's a really exciting piece of research, which, uh, which Maxime will be talking about in the next talk. So how do we predict how a graphene oxide structure will change during a reaction? Um, so there were, this group did some DFT simulations of how reactive different sites of graphene oxides would be. So um, the way graphene, graphene is oxidized is uh, a, a potassium permanganate ion comes in and attaches to a carbon-carbon bond in graphene and then removes and leaves a functional group behind. And that is, uh, the reactivity is very dependent on the chemistry around that group. So they simulated 50 possible sites with different functional groups around it. And we wanted to see if we could interpolate into to possibly characterize every possible site. Um, and therefore we could like iterate the structure through time and end up with a realistic structure of graphene oxide. So uh, here on the bottom left, we've got um, like a cutout of graphene and the green patch is where the manganate ion attaches uh, to the graphene surface. And then we can characterize each of the sites and how they're functionalized. Um, so, you know, with 50 data points, there's not a lot of data there. And, you know, using this, there's many thousands of possible sites, which perhaps is tractable, but we didn't think it was necessary to simulate all of those. So we can interpolate between them. And we chose to do this with a random forest regressor. So each of these sites, well, so each reactive site uh, then has eight features. So for example, it has the number of first neighbors, which are alcohol groups above the plane. And there's eight features like that. Um, and that can be numbered one, zero to eight. And the random forest regressor seems to work really well for this because it handles discrete inputs well. Uh, other techniques were tried. We tried some um, an empirical model, which sort of uh, which used some uh, intuition or like scientific intuition from the papers outcomes, um, and some other machine learning models. But the regret, random forest regressor was the best. Uh, so here's our fit. It's not amazing, but you know it. it I'll show you why we think this is a good enough fit. Um, so we take, we've, you know, we model this random forest regressor and then iterate through time, iteratively add functional groups and see how the structure evolves. Uh, and uh, for anyone who's interested, this is maybe not the best place, but you know, this is all on GitHub and it's freely available. And I'd like to be happy to talk about it with anyone. So um, what is important is the sizes of these domains and like the structure of them so uh, we tend to find that the structure like depending on whichever model we used to build this structure the graphene oxide um, or the oxidized regions are very amorphous um, there's no particular standout characteristics between the like relationship of locations of the functional groups um but the what does change is the relative size of the different domains and that's really important for things like when you're looking at molecules absorbing onto the surface and dispersion um uh yeah so you know and the experimental data for this is kind of uh, difficult to work with but um we think we've you know we can sort of try and fit uh, these size of islands to an experimental data as well as another way of validating our results. So next, um, we wanted to see, you know, if you've got a two-phase evolving region, you really, um, and you'd be very interested in its percolation threshold. So say we 
you know, we model a uh, growing oxidized domain as a growing circle. Then we have this two-phase system and we can study how it evolves over time much more efficiently. This is kind of like a surrogate model. And if we increase the nucleation frequency, so that's how often a reaction happens on a, like, on a pristine graphene site, we end up with a different behavior. So the reason we're interested in, so I'm stopping each of these animations when the percolation threshold is reached. And um, the reason we're interested in this is because uh, once the oxidized region, shown in pink here, uh, are percolating, you can expect graphene oxidized properties to significantly fall off. So things like its mechanical strength, its conductive properties, um, and its semiconductive properties will you know, change drastically after this percolation threshold. <clears throat> and um, what's kind of interesting is that when we increase this nucleation rate, um, the sort of the amount of oxidization that's happened is different. Uh, and this relationship is shown here. So on the, at the y-axis, we've got like how much oxygen was added to the graphene sheet. And you know the, the physical understanding or intuition behind this relationship is not really known. So if anyone has any thoughts on that, I'd be very happy to discuss. So now I'm going to talk about the uh, applications of this model. So you know we've done the theory behind it. Um, so we build uh, coarse grain structures of graphene oxide, put that in a polymer, and we can really then predict well uh, when these graphene oxide of graphene will disperse and aggregate in a, in a material. So this is a really difficult problem and one of the main challenges to um, working on nanocomposites. And we find that uh, like big, large graphitic domains, they have very strong interactions with each other. But if we can disrupt that with more oxidization, they'll move, but you know, they will disperse. Um, um, it's also useful for like some biological applications that we're working on. Um, so we're, you know, here we're looking at uh, nanomaterial induced cytotoxicity. Uh, and uh, so graphene oxide is readily functionalized. functionalized. So you can really use it to uh, add uh, certain uh, target side chains. Side chains to the group will, will target certain proteins in the body. Uh, and any sort of 2D nanomaterial will be, um, well, it's likely to be toxic. So th this is um, you know, an interesting application of uh, graphene and graphene oxide. Um, finally, we've been studying how the um, dispersion of these functional groups will affect its mechanical properties. Um, and uh, so, uh, as might be expected, the more oxidation that occurs, um, the, mechanic, uh, the Young's modulus and uh, will decrease. But we can also probe things like uh, fracture toughness and um, uh, rigidity. So finally, as promised, I'm going to talk about the uh, the Beckman toolkit. So all the simulations that you've seen have been informed by um, uh, this library of tools, which uh, is used for generating ensembles, uh, uh, submission on HPC clusters. Um, so, uh, well, so one tool I want to talk about in particular is Easy EasyVVUQ. Uh, and this is a Python 3 library, which uh, will help you generate um, ensembles of simulations and help you efficiently sample your inputs. And there's lots of tools inside which I do not have anywhere near enough time to talk about here. Um, but essentially you can um, you can tell it uh, your parameters and you can tell it how to read your input files and then it will you know help you efficiently sample your uh, input input parameter space. Uh, so here on the right, we're looking at just a, a simple example of a 2D, uh, a two-dimensional phase space that's being sampled using stochastic collocation. So uh, the sampling is closer, the sample is more dense near the edges, obviously, to try and um, give you better stats on on uh, the edges of your of your uh, input space. Um, so this has been a really useful library for me. So 
the mechanical properties of graphene oxides that I was showing on the previous slides, this, you know, there's lots of different inputs that we can use and generating thousands of simulations automatically with this library is very useful. Um, also within the Vecma toolkit, there's uh, tools for job submission and uh, like uh, FabSim and uh, QCG pilot job. Um, and you know, I, I think a lot of people might find that useful. So in summary, you know, I've shown uh, how we can uh, predict and interpolate uh, graphene oxide reactivity using a random forest regressor based on uh, some DFT calculations. And then that is shown how that's, well, we talk about how that accurate graphene oxide structure is important for uh, many applications. Um, and with that, I would like to thank my collaborators and uh, uh, all of you here for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Robert, for your great talk about graphene oxide. It's really interesting to see how this uh, graphene oxide can be functionalized also. And I just um, want to ask if there are any questions with regard to this talk. And please um, raise your hands and ask Robert. David, I can't raise my hand, but I can speak. Can you hear me? Peter, can yeah. yeah. May I yeah. uh, introduce a little discussion there? Thanks, uh, Robbie, for that nice, clear talk. Um, I'd like to sort of um, add to, or somewhat expand on his comments to do with this Vecma toolkit, because it is Get, it does have significant visibility inside Comp Biomed 2 now, and I think many people listening in will have recognized the importance of having this kind of VBUQ ultimately as a certification for, for the, as it were, the validity of simulations that we perform, because that's going to become essential with agencies like the FDA and the USA already quite proactive in that space and then the EMA in Europe they'll be insisting on all of this before you can get any of the kind of aspirations of comp biomed genuinely into the furniture of clinical decision making through regulatory approvals so it, it's I think quite an important environment to be aware of uh, I wanted to make sure folks are at conscious that, for example, SERPSAR is deploying that toolkit at the moment, and if Marco Vidicchio is on the line in a while, he might confirm where he's got to with that. It's also meant to be being deployed by LRZ on SuperMook NG. I hope I'm not taking anyone by surprise there, and that's because LRZ is also a partner in Vecna. Going back to what Ben Limecooler was talking about, yesterday in his presentation, people may have been eagle-eyed and spotted one of the open issues around machine learning is indeed uncertainty quantification. It's sort of not very clear how well that is operating at this moment, and the Vecna toolkit potentially could be used to address those kind of uh, issues in the end. Robbie's slide, last one, did say we'd be discussing this in the hackathon on day three, which unfortunately has now evaporated by virtue of this being a um, sort of virtual conference. But I do hope we'll find some venue in which we can talk about how to use those tools more generally in due course in Comp Biomed 2. Thank you, David. Thanks, thanks Peter.